John chapter 9, as we see here, introduces us to a man who was rejected. Uh, he was one who really was born with the right race, if you want to put it in those terms. He was born with the right religion. He was raised in the right country, according to uh, all that we would expect of God's chosen people, but still rejected by his own society. And we know that because we find him in John chapter 9 as a beggar. We also know, uh, because of what Scripture tells us, that he begs because he's blind. But the question really here this morning is, why is he blind? We're not interested in wondering why he begs. We know that. Why was he rejected? We know that. But why is he blind? And that question really is a sort of pervasive question that has application to, I think, many of our lives even here in this room. There are certain things about ourselves or about other people that cause us to question God. Why is it that I or they have been born with such a disadvantage over other people? You ever wonder that? People ask this about God all the time. What is it that accounts for the various and obvious disparities that we can see very clearly between one person and the next? Why is one person born healthy while another person is born with a handicap? God's fault or theirs? Why do some people grow up to be beautiful and others grow up to be ugly? Why are some people allowed to live a life of opulence and luxury while others seem to be singled out for poverty? Is there an answer to that? What is it that allows one person to have the advantage right out of the gate? Maybe they were born into a loving Christian family. They were well taken care of. They had everything going for them. But then there's somebody else born somewhere else who's subject to abuse and cruelty and neglect within their own family. Who's to blame? Some would blame God. A lot of people would blame God. They see the disparities in the world, or they see perhaps their own misfortune as evidence of divine cruelty, discrimination, and then they use that misfortune as an excuse to reject God. Some will do that. Some have done that. Some perhaps are doing that. Others, who know better than to blame God, are still searching for answers. Why would God allow it? Well, maybe they blame the individual, or they blame themselves. They think that there is something that's gone wrong and that it's their fault. They see hardship, they see difficulty in life as perhaps some sort of punishment. They've done something to personally offend God, and this is his retribution. You remember Job's friends in Scripture, if you are familiar with the Old Testament account there of a man who was righteous and yet fell into great calamity and suffered great personal loss. He had some friends that weren't the best of friends. <laughs> they kept after him, trying to figure out what he had done wrong. What did you do? You must have done something. Nobody has this kind of thing happen to them without having done something to God to offend him, to deserve this. So the disciples are asking Jesus here in the beginning of John chapter 9, what's the reason here? What, what accounts for this man's blindness? Did he sin against God? Did his parents sin against God? Is this, you know, karma? What's the deal? They give him two options, and Jesus says, neither. Neither. I think sometimes we're just asking God the wrong questions. Was it his parents or was it him? No and no. So ask again. Keep, keep coming. What are the, let's get to the bottom of this. Jesus isn't opposed to answers. He's just opposed to some of the things that we're asking. Um, sometimes it's not really a matter of who's to blame here. It's a matter of what's it for? What's God's intent? Good for us. He reveals what the intent is by the end of verse 3. In this case, it's for the glory of God. Is that hard to believe? 
at some of the worst things in your life, and you have them, you have them, consider those things right now and ask yourself, is it hard to believe that that was meant for God's glory? That hard for you to believe that God maybe intends to use your life and all things in it, including the things that you'd change in a heartbeat if you could, that you would rewind the clock and fix if you could. Does he? Is he? Does he? It, is he capable of using all things for good? That's a question we need to come to grips with. A lot of people, it's hard for them to believe that God's able to make something beautiful out of the mess that their life has become. And some people's lives are quite messy. Do you think it's possible that God intends to take our ugliness, and that could be physical, that could be spiritual, that could be mental, that could be relational. Do you think that God is able to, and perhaps intends to, take that ugliness and salvage glory from it, make it beautiful in his own time. Now, this guy was born blind. He's an adult now, so I don't know, 20 years, 30 years? It took a while, didn't it? And some of us were just too impatient. Fix it now! I've been blind forever! In time. For those who trust Christ, I believe that God intends to fix it all sooner or later. Maybe not in the first 80 years, but he will shortly thereafter. We need to wait on God. In the meantime, God is going to allow hardship in our lives. He's going to allow handicap so that he can show the world what he's capable of. Are you okay with that? Let's not forget that he's God, we're not. So he, we, he gets to use us. Okay? It's kind of silly, but I always use this analogy of making a sandwich. If I'm the one who made the sandwich, I get to do whatever I want with that sandwich. It can't complain. If I want to make that sandwich to eat it, I'm going to eat it. If I make that sandwich to share it, I get to share it. It's my sandwich. If I make it to throw it in the garbage, what does that matter to the sandwich? (laughs) Right? I'm the creator here. God, too, is our creator. And even in those whose lives have become a wreck, For somebody who's sorely disadvantaged, somebody who's impoverished, abused, outcast, ugly, it would help if they were able to see their life as a blank canvas upon which God could, if they'll let him, paint a masterpiece. But the (laughs) the big question is, would you let him? Or are we going to hold this against God? Are we going to continue refusing to cooperate with him? That's kind of the decision that this blind beggar is being faced with in John chapter 9. How's he going to, what's he going to do? Somebody come up and starts rubbing dirt in your eyes. What are you going to do? Are you going to let him? I mean, you ever, you ever think, I can't believe this guy even let Jesus do that. He doesn't know... If you notice, he just calls Jesus a man. Some dude named Jesus rubbed a bunch of dirt in my eyes and told me to go take a bath. I figured I should. It's a big step. I want to pretend for a second here that we don't know anything beyond verse 5. We covered those five verses last week. But at this point, Jesus has done nothing to this blind man in Verse 1, he simply noticed him. In verse 2, his disciples were inquiring about him. In verse 3, 4, and 5, Jesus says a few deeply doctrinal statements, but it isn't until verse 6 that he really begins to interact with this blind beggar. So if we pretend that we don't know anything beyond verse 5, the story at this point seems to hinge on the compliance of the beggar. Is he going to cooperate with Jesus Christ? Before I go any further, I want to ask you. Will you? Are you going to cooperate with him? Really, your life comes down to that question. 
Will you cooperate with Christ? It's easy for us to sit here on a Sunday morning in a church of all places and go, yes, uh uh-huh, I will. Really? In your personal life? Your private life? Your secret life? The life you live when no one else is around? The life you have when you're not here? Are you going to cooperate with Christ? So Jesus spits in the dirt, makes clay, rubs it in his eyes, and then he says to him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, I, listen, never let it be said that the work of Christ is without offense. It has the potential to offend. Not only is he doing what is forbidden on the Sabbath, okay? Spitting was not allowed on Saturday. Making mud was not allowed on Saturdays. Okay, they had very strict rules that went above and beyond the commands of God in the Old Testament, but nevertheless, they were a violation of their rules, and they did offend the Pharisees. Not only was that done on the Sabbath, but think of what the bystanders thought of this carpenter, okay, just, just a local kid, kind of now he's grown up, and he's kind of, he seems to be a little copy, cocky, just walking around Jerusalem, walking around the country like he owns the place, which of course he does, because when you own it, when you create it, you own it. He's walking around like he owns a place, bossing people around, yelling at the religious elite, doing whatever he pleases, violating the Sabbath. Suddenly, this carpenter, think of what the bystanders thought of this, spits in the dirt, makes mud, wipes it in the guy's eyes, tells him to take a bath. I don't know if it really offended people, but I could imagine that if I saw that happen on the corner, there's a beggar down there, can't see, and I know that he can't see. And somebody that I'm not familiar with does what Jesus just did to the guy. I've got questions. <laughs> Maybe I'm a little put off. Not to mention how awkward it might have been for the beggar. And how easily, by verse 6, he could have refused to cooperate any further. I mean, you know, he can't see it coming. He feels hands on his face. He's got, Ugh. And then the dirt. At that point, you swat the hands away and go, what are you doing? I don't like the work you're doing in my life, Jesus Christ, Son of God. Stop it. Does that sound familiar? I forbid you, Messiah, from going any further with what you intend to do in my life. I'm offended already. I won't take another step. I don't want this. Yes, but if you don't go any further, you'll remain blind. Don't care. I don't care. I'm fine. I make a decent living begging. I don't want it. For a lot of people, their story ends at the first part of verse 7. Did you know that? There's a lot of people whose story ends here. They have personal problems. Their life is a wreck. They're more than qualified to bring God glory. But when Jesus shows up, they're just put off by what he requires of them which is cooperation, that's all. And so they fall short of salvation. It goes no further than verse 7 for them. Their story ends before it even had a chance to begin. You must say yes to Christ. Yeah, but he wants to make my life dirty. Isn't it already? Yeah, but he's going to make it worse. I mean, like, I'm blind already. He just want to cake my eyes with mud. Do you have something to lose? This man, however, unlike some, obeys. He obeys. Hey, listen, that's, that's a score, man. Somebody beginning to obey Jesus Christ, that's a win for the church. This is what we love to see. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. So he does, and he comes back seeing. 
Did you get that? Because of his obedience, he's able to see. Had he not obeyed Jesus, he would never have seen anything. Ask any Christian, any legit born-again believer, the best things that you've seen in life, whether it be with your eyes or just the life you've lived. What accounts for that? What accounts for the best things in life? Any legit Christian is going to say, it's because I obeyed. Or at least me. <laughs> I'll tell you, the best things that I have experienced in life, the best things that I have seen in life, came out of my own obedience to God Almighty. Had I not obeyed, I would not have gone to the other side of the world, I don't know how many times. And that's my, that's my thing. I love travel. Okay? Had I not obeyed God, I would not be here. Had I not obeyed God, I wouldn't have begun this church. Had I not obeyed God, I wouldn't have met the best friends I've ever met in my life. Had I not obeyed God, I wouldn't have met my wife who I love dearly. Had I not obeyed God, I wouldn't have the children that I adore. Had I not obeyed God, and he just keeps, it gets better. I'm not, this isn't, this isn't health and wealth and prosperity. It isn't, this is just obey God if you want joy. That's pretty biblical. I mean, I think the guy probably got a charge out of being able to see. You know, we, we watch it happen there, and it's like, didn't make you wonder? Like he's looking at his reflection in the water. What was that like? I swear, there's going to be videotapes in heaven. We're going we're gonna to watch it in real time. We'll get to see it. I want to watch this one. Go up to the, There's a whole shelf full of VHS in heaven. You know, one of them says John 9. It's like, yeah, get that one. Yeah, yeah. Pop it into the VCR. You guys know what VCRs are? You guys are young over here. You guys know what VCRs are? They're these things that, yeah. I think that there's angels everywhere with like invisible video cams getting everything on tape. We'll get to watch it. I want to watch this one. What was that like for him? Seeing for the first time. Do you think he was excited? I'm guessing he was. Was he shocked? Was he, a, a, I wonder if there was just a threat of fear. Like, who is this guy? Not the guy in the reflection. Well, him too. <laughs> The other guy, the, I mean, the questions come flooding, and like, if he's capable of that with dirt, what is he capable of next with my life? Well, obedience, and, and everybody here needs to know this. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're a believer or not. Did you know that? Uh, you don't need to be a believer to obey God. I would stand firm on that statement. You don't need to even believe in Jesus Christ to open. This guy didn't believe in him. He didn't know who he is. Go get washed. Okay. And because he obeyed, he was blessed. Doesn't matter where your faith is at this morning. Obedience precedes blessing. Jesus told us that. In Luke chapter 11, verse 28, he says, Blessed are those who obey. Blessed are those who obey. So he does. And now he can see. And he comes back seeing. And then his neighbors are noticing all of this. In verse 8, when they see the man, they're like, isn't it the guy that used to beg by the temple here? And then some said, yeah, that's him. Others said, no, it just looks like him. <laughs> and then he himself goes, no, it's me. <sighs> I see you. <laughs> you know, like, didn't know you looked like that, but here we are. So they're all noticing. You know why? Because obedience gets people's attention. Think about it this way. You spent your whole life not obeying God, and suddenly you do? That'll get people's attention because you're no longer obeying self. It's typically how that works. We're self-governed. We do what works for us. We live our life in a way that serves our own interests. And then suddenly God comes along and we're living our life for somebody else's interests. People notice. Obedience gets people's attention. 
and there's enough of a change in this man that they knew he couldn't have done it on his own. So they start asking him in verse 10, what, how did this happen? Not how did you do this, but what went on that made this happen in your life? Has there been that kind of change in you, believer? You say you're a Christian. Has there been a change so profound in you that other people know you're not making it up? Because I can play Christianity. I mean, I can make myself go to church pretty, pretty regular. I can, make, I can start reading the Bible more. I can start praying and stuff before I eat. And, and people would notice that. But that's, those are minor changes that anybody can fake. But do the people around you notice differences in you since you became a Christian that they know you can't make up? There's just something's different about that person. He's forced to give an answer because they come with questions. Verse 8, 9, 10. A barrage of questions, all kinds of opinions about this guy. He's forced into a position now where he has to answer, which he does in verse 11. Now, let me say something here. At this point in the narrative, the man can see, he can see, but as far as we tell, he isn't saved. He can see there's been a physical change, but there is no spiritual change that's taken place in the man. In fact, if we read ahead, you'll see that Jesus doesn't address the salvation issue until verse 35. So there's been obedience in the man's life. He's benefited from that obedience, but hey guys, we're not saved by obedience. Did you know that? You can obey God all you like, and you'll be blessed. Jesus promised in Luke 11. But it won't save you. We're saved by faith, not by obedience. Maybe obedience is going to play a part in the salvation of your soul, but it isn't faith itself. So, hey, please, please, don't put too much confidence in your obedience. You can make yourself obey. Okay? The devil obeys God. He has to. God puts parameters on him, lets him do what he wants but goes no further. devil has to mind what God said when God places restrictions upon him. Judas obeyed God. Obedience doesn't save. So here now we're going to see the great difference really between obedience and faith. The man has obeyed, uh, but in many respects that was the easy part. Go wash in the pool. Okay, I can do that. I've done that before. I'll do it again at your command. Not a problem. And so he obeys Jesus, but he isn't saved yet. Now, now mind something here. The terrain that this man is going to walk between his obedience and faith. Okay, he's obeyed, but he, we're still waiting on the salvation part. The road in between, the, the path he has to walk before arriving at faith, is going to be very, very rough. Very rough. Taking a bath at Jesus' command, that was the easy part. Coming to saving faith in Christ, this is going to be virtually impossible. Especially if he cares too much of what other people think. So this guy's in the hot seat, verse 11. He's being interrogated by a very unpredictable group of people. <laughs> and he has to decide whether he's going to save himself by padding the truth or put himself in the position of needing to be saved by telling the truth. He's been saved physically, but he needs to be saved spiritually, doesn't he? Now, I've already said this, but it's worth repeating. Jesus has healed the beggar's eyes, but he hasn't confronted him about his unbelief yet. 
Not till verse 35, Jesus addresses that issue. But pay close attention to what it will cost this man to get to verse 35. Okay? This is what it will cost him. And we'll deal with this next week. We didn't read this part of the text, but if you read ahead, you'll see that this is the cost for this man to get to verse 35 where his salvation is secured. He starts by being absolutely grilled by the people in his community. Then he's going to be brought before national religious leaders for cross-examination. I dare say that that might have been a bit uncomfortable for him. He's going to be shunned by his parents. He's going to be threatened, intimidated, mocked, reviled, badgered, belittled, and finally, excommunicated from the synagogue. And he could avoid all of that pain. Right here in verse 11. He could avoid all of what's to come in his traveling forward into verse 35 where salvation will be secure if right now he simply answers their questions with a little less information than he knew was true. All he has to do is water it down a little bit, take off the rough edges, and tell them what their itching ears want to hear. But pay attention here, guys. If this beggar decides to scale back on the truth in order to save himself from persecution, then Jesus never has a chance to save him. John chapter 9 never gets to verse 35. This man's belief in Christ is never confirmed. Christ's lordship is never confessed, which is what happens in verse 36. This man's misunderstandings of Jesus are never clarified, which takes place in verse 37. True worship is never offered. All of which, all of which are evidence of true faith and salvation. So if he soft pedals the truth and answers these people in a very benign way, I might suggest to you that the man will never be saved. So this beggar is at what we might call a very critical point in his relationship with Jesus. Is he going to let Jesus save him? Is he going to stand firm on the truth? And let Jesus save him from the trouble it's going to get him in? Or is he going to save himself? A quota line from an unknown author who says it would have served this man's worldly interests to cushion the truth as to what had been done for him. He could have enjoyed the benefits of the work of Christ and yet avoided the rough path of testimony for his name in the face of the world's hostility. He would have enjoyed his eyesight, kept his religion, reaped the fruit of Christ's work, and at the same time, escaped the reproach of confessing his name, end quote. You ever tempted to do that? I bet you are. It's very tempting. How many of you would so boldly say that we're out there living exactly how Christ wants us to live without cowering in the least. We're bold as the Apostle Paul. We're in the face of the world, standing strong for the truth. That ain't easy. Not in this world. Not in this country. Not in 2019, that's for sure. And what makes this man so amazing is that he didn't even try to do that. This guy is just... Tells it like it is. Withholding the full force of the truth is the easiest way to avoid persecution. And many of us know that just as well as the Apostle Peter does. You remember when he did that? Withheld the full force of the truth? It's called denial. It's what the Apostle Paul calls being ashamed of the gospel. 
it makes me shudder to think of how many people may have fallen short of salvation because of that fear they have toward man that we don't see in this beggar who got saved. I don't see any fear of man. He's going to give a very clear testimony for what he knows of Christ in the face of great hostility. In Luke chapter 9, verse 26, Jesus says, if anyone's ashamed of me and my message, then I'll be ashamed of that person when I return. That's a little unnerving. I guess Jesus wants to save us, doesn't he? So the man says, as much as he knows, a man called Jesus made clay, anointed my eyes, and then said, go wash in the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received my sight. It's not enough for them. They still got more questions in verse 12. Where is he? Now they're asking questions he can't answer. So he doesn't try. He just says, oh no. I don't know. Sometimes it's okay if you don't have all the answers. Please don't pretend like you do. Admit to people that you don't have it. I don't know. Oh, the simplicity of this man's testimony is just beautiful. He didn't know a whole lot, but he did speak what he knew. That's all that God expects of us. That you don't withhold the truth and that you don't go beyond the truth that you have. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus says, if anyone's ashamed of me and my message, I'll be ashamed of that person when he returns. Listen to what he says in Luke 12. He says, anyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will acknowledge in the presence of angels. It's the opposite. It's the positive of the negative we read in Luke 9. If you won't speak boldly and truthfully, then this. But if you do, then this. And that's exactly what the man does. They bring him to the Pharisees. The intimidation is only growing. Clarifies for us in verse 14 why the Pharisees were so upset, because it was a Sabbath. I bet you Jesus could have done this on a Tuesday morning and they would have been upset. You know, Thursday, Friday, don't matter. This Saturday was convenient to get upset. You know, well, he's not supposed to do that. Mm. Thank God he did it on the Sabbath, right? Because then at least we have an excuse for being angry with God. <laughs> so they're just drilling him. Well, this man can't be from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. And notice in verse 16, others among the Pharisees said, well, but how can a man who's a sinner do this? And there was a division among them. And they asked him, but what do you say about him? What do you think? He opened your eyes and he says, he's a prophet. That's what I think. He's a prophet. Now, uh, if you're unaware of this, I'll tell you this morning that Jesus is more than prophet. <laughs> and I think that most of us know that. He's much more than a prophet. So, this man's answer in verse 17 might look a little bit like he's taking a self-protective measure here, like tapering back, like he's not going to go, he's God Almighty, the Son of Jehovah. You know, mm -mm. He's a prophet. It looks like he's being soft here, but the opposite is true. You remember in verse 11, he only knew Jesus as a man. So by the time we get to verse 17, he's actually elevated in his opinion of Jesus and doesn't back down from that at all. He easily could have kept with the opinion he had of him in verse 11 and saved himself perhaps from any further grief, but instead he chooses to verbalize his growing esteem for Christ knowing that it isn't going to make his immediate situation any better. He does it anyway, doesn't care. That's bold. Now how do we explain such boldness in a guy, especially such a young Christian? You'd expect them to be the most intimidated, and yet they're oftentimes the most Bold. It seems to our shame that the longer you're a Christian, the more quiet you become. Some of you, you remember when you first got saved? You remember the first Christmas when you went home to mom and dad after you got saved? You're like, Jesus is real. 
And now we go home for Christmas and we're like, pass the stuffing. You know, I mean, where's the zeal? You know, the whole churches have a tendency to cool off a little bit in their passion for Christ. And Jesus doesn't like that much at all. So here's this young man who's not going to back down in his opinion of Christ. Why? What's going on there that causes him to be so bold? Well, we need to recognize that there are two invisible forces at work in this situation and that those forces are working together. Two invisible forces. One, faith. This beggar is coming now under the influence of faith. He's obeyed Christ, but now he's walking toward a life of faith. And faith is invisible, but there it is operating in this man. The other invisible force that's at work is God himself. God's there giving the man, supplying him with the boldness that he needs, which the Bible says will be done to us if we will position ourselves where we need some. He'll empower you if you're willing to follow him into places where you kind of need power. But if your Christian life is nothing more than getting done what you would have to get done whether you were a Christian or not, like getting up on Monday morning for work, what does he need to empower you for that? Hey, just get up. If you need help getting up, get a louder alarm clock or something. Turn the volume up on your phone. Uh, you don't need the Holy Spirit for these things. We see God himself at work, not only in the beggar, but also among unnamed men in the ranks of the Pharisees. We don't know who these guys are, but if you noticed in verse 16, there's a division happening within the ranks of the Pharisees, and some are on the attack, and others are on the defense of Christ. And I have to wonder if among them isn't perhaps Nicodemus. You remember he's a Pharisee? Six chapters ago, he was having a conversation with Christ. And we know that by the end of John's book, he will be revealed as a disciple of Jesus Christ. So there's faith growing in him too. And you have to wonder if Nicodemus isn't one of those that's going, hey, but no, 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 don't jump to conclusions. How could a man who is a sinner do such signs? Come on, give him a break. Is is this Nicodemus? We don't know who it was. But God regularly uses the faith of his people as a catalyst for the salvation he's bringing about in others. We see him working even in this beggar as his faith is beginning to grow to be a witness in the life of these Pharisees that need Jesus too. He'll do that with you. Would you like to be a part of that kind of work? Some people live for that. And when God uses them in such a way, they don't care if it got them in hot water. They don't care what kind of trouble. They don't mind the risk. They don't care about the pain. Use me, God. Use me. God used this blind beggar to reveal his work in him. That's why he was born blind. That's why he was blind for 20 years, 30 years before Jesus showed up because God intended to reveal his work in and through that man. Is there any greater testimony than that? Would you like a similar testimony? That by the time you're said and done, your life on earth is over, that God revealed his work to the world through you. But why a blind beggar? You know, God could choose anybody. Would you agree? He use it, right? We're all his sandwiches. <laughs> so he could choose to do anything through anybody, and yet 1 Corinthians 1.27 tells us that God chose the things of the world that they consider foolish, things that the world considers powerless, things despised by the world, things counted as nothing, Those are the things God chooses to reveal his work in and through. Why does he do that? Why does he use handicaps? Why does he use the disadvantaged? 
Why does he use the abused and the neglected and the impoverished and all of those that he chooses to use? He has his reasons, and I'm not going to pretend to know what those reasons are, but I do know something about that target demographic. They have nothing, nothing to offer God. And God doesn't ever want you to be left with the impression that you helped him. God does not want you to mistakenly believe that you were picked because you were special. Like he needed you. He doesn't choose us because we're beautiful. Why this man? Why did God choose this man? Because he had so little to lose. He had nothing to offer God and nothing to hold on to. This guy was a beggar. A beggar. He had no social status. He had no reputation to hang on to, like some of us might. He had no riches to fear losing, like some of us might. He had no dignity to protect and defend, like some of us might. What a lucky guy. What a lucky guy. Hey, and isn't it interesting that nobody in our world would look at somebody like that and go, lucky. Really? Makes you wonder who's the real handicap in this world, doesn't it? Is it the blind? Or is it those who can see? Jesus has an opinion on that, and we'll read about it next week. Who's at the greatest disadvantage? Is it the poor? And the lame? And the deaf? Y'all got something in your life that you don't like? Praise God for that. Praise God for that. Thank God for whatever it is that makes you desperate. If you have nothing, nothing, then how are you going to qualify as a candidate to be one whom God chooses if you're not foolish, powerless, and despised by the world, the very things God chooses? You don't need Jesus then. You're not a beggar this morning? You can see just fine? Life's okay without him? Okay. Carry on then. Carry on then. Carry on. We all need to come to a place in life before it's too late where we see that that's us. We're blind. We're begging. We got nothing to offer anybody. And we have all the need in the world. Do you see yourself as needy? this morning. Jesus would love to help you. Will you let him? Jesus would love to save you. You going to cooperate? The work he tries to do in your life might offend you. You okay with that? The work he does is beautiful especially in comparison to what we're able to do with our life. We're good at making a mess. Jesus is real good at cleaning it up. He'll do it if you let him.